Good morning. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is so good to see everyone this morning. I don't know about you from yesterday to this morning. I think the temperature has jumped like jumped down 60 degrees. But you are here to worship God and I want to welcome you in Christ's holy name. It is an exciting time of the year. Next Sunday we will enjoy music, the whole hour of music. The Handbell Choir will do four pieces and they've been working very hard and it sounds lovely. And the cantata is coming along and it sounded beautiful on Wednesday. And you will listen to some beautiful music next Sunday. So don't come by yourself. Come with somebody and enjoy the beautiful music. As you walked in today, there was a sock dry basket. We are collecting socks. Today is the last day to collect socks, and those socks will be distributed around the shelters in Rome community. This Saturday at noon, uh, UMW and Methodist men and teenagers, they are sponsoring a Christmas party. You don't have to be a member of UMM, UMW, or teenagers. All of you are invited and welcome. There's going to be good food and good music. So I invite all of you to come. As an insert in the bulletin is the reservation form. We need to have reservation. So make sure you do that today. There are all the, those are all the announcements I have. I will be visiting shut-ins this week and the following week. And if you have anybody that you want me to visit, Please let me know. Scotty always, every year, graciously provide those can peppermint sticks and beautiful fruit basket, and I have them. And if you have anybody that you, that you want me to visit, please let me know. This morning, as our Advent light uh, candle lighter, I have invited Vicki Thomaston and Wayne Wilkie. It is a reunion every time we go home. Every time we embrace those we love, no matter how long it has been, it feels like sunrise, like the clouds are parting and the rain has ended. It is joy, nothing less than pure joy, to grab hold of those who are home for us, who make home for us. Whether we wake up to them every day or travel many miles to see them again, it is a joy to go home. The prophet Zephaniah tells us to rejoice as the thought of going home. The prophet tells us to imagine being set free, being unburdened, being released to live, to fully live in the grace and wonder of life itself, surrounded by those who love us like no one else. And then to live like that was our truth even now. Even here, it is joy to go home. John the Baptist reminds us, however, that it takes choices to live in this joy. It doesn't just happen. We choose to make life a joy by how we love others, by how we serve and give and care for others, by how we do the job we do, and how we impact the world around us. We build joy as we build a home in this world and the next. We light these candles, the candle of hope and of peace and of joy, as a sign that we see on our way home and we walk with a skip to our step because we can see the destination and it is pure of joy. It is time to go home. Lungs, 
kidneys, brain, and gastrointestinal organs. He was the first case in Glen County. None of the doctors in Brunswick knew how to care for him, so he was transferred to Jacksonville, Florida to, for treatment to the Children's Hospital. Braden was in critical condition and was put in ICU. There were lots of concerns about damage to his vital organs and he was on oxygen. We remember them posting a picture on Facebook of our sweet great-grandson hooked up to tubes and monitors. It was a very scary time for our family. We started putting Braden's name on every prayer list here at church and other family members' churches. Each day, the updates went from concerns and fears to praise and hope. On January 26th, we received a text that Braden was being weaned from oxygen and physical therapy was starting to work for, with him to regain his strength. On January 27th, Braden was discharged from the hospital and was recovering at home. Within the span of a week, our family went from fearing the worst to celebrating God's healing. If not for everyone's prayers, this could have been a very different outcome for him. Now when we see Braden and talk to him, there are no signs of his ordeal. We are constantly reminded how blessed we are to still have him in our lives. Nowadays, we say I love you a lot more, hug a little tighter, and thank God for our miracle. We have learned many lessons during the pandemic. But most importantly, to hold on to the ones you love the most and to thank God every day for all his blessings, big and small. Amen. Sing we know of Christmas, no sing we hear. Hear our grateful praises to the name so dear. Sing we know the King is born Noel. Sing we Righteousness come. Unto all who have been mistreated and abused. God who is compassion come. Unto all who are sick and need of healing. God who is love come. Unto all who faith and live in fear. Come, the Lord Jesus.
But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrath, you are one of the little clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall live secure, for now he, has, he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. Blessed be the Lord. Amen. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel of Luke, second chapter, beginning with verse 8. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he is very pleased. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be God. Please be seated. Let's pray together. God, we're so grateful that along life's journey that you send us angels along the way to remind us of your grace and your strength and your mercy and to encourage us and to empower us so that we may stand on the higher ground. We're grateful that we have one another to encourage one another and to care for one another. During this season, may your holy love in Jesus Christ manifest so strongly that we may experience a love that transforms our lives and the lives of people. May you use each and every one of us as your holy angels in our community. May all the words of my mouth and all the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you. You are indeed our rock, our redeemer, and our savior. In your holy and precious name we pray, amen. We're in a sermon series of old Christmas carols. I talked about the oldest carol started out as chants by priests and monks during the medieval age. In fact, it started way in the third century AD. And these Christmas carols were used during Christian service. And the oldest Christmas carol that we have in the hymnal, in the United Methodist hymnal, is of the Father's love begotten. Comes from Ambrose's time in the fourth century AD, who was the Archbishop of Milan. We studied the medieval Christmas carol last week, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, goes all the way back to the eighth century AD. And traditionally, these were, uh, stanzas were sung right before Christmas. So seven days to remind, remind all of us how exciting it is that the Messiah is coming to us in person. O come, O come, Emmanuel. 
I want you to remember that and make sure you read a stanza every day the last week of Christmas. When Christmas Carol started, it started as a chant, and then in the medieval time, and you know, the Catholic Church has uh, gotten big and, and uh, it almost has become a routine kind of rote kind of thing. They became a dance music, Christmas carols. So that oftentimes they danced in the tunes of Christmas carols. That's from 11th century AD to 15th century AD. When the Reformation started though, uh, the Reformation really started in reaction to the old, uh, some of the pagan traditions of Catholic Church, and they went all the way the other. You know, when pendulum swings, it swings from one end to the other. So this uh, dancing music and, and really, you know, drinking and merrymaking, so the Protestant Reformation movement has gone all the way, you know, Puritanism and, and Sphinkly and Calvinism and all those, they really bar joyful music, especially Calvin. Calvin did not want anything in the service that distracts our true heart, our true worship of God. So during Calvin's time in the 16th century, they took away all the ornaments in the sanctuary, all music, they even took away musical instruments that they played, and that's true. So all the Christmas carols that we enjoy so much this day, they actually come from 18th, 19th century because of the Calvinistic influence. 15th, 16th, 17th, well, Calvin was 16th century. Those times, we didn't produce any lively, good music. So today, we have this 19th century carol. It came upon the midnight clear. Now, some of you are not very familiar with this carol. I'm very familiar with it. This is the carol that I grew up with. The reason is, you know, we all have the billboard charts of music. Um, there's a chart for Christmas carols. So in Korea, the number one favorite Christmas carol of all people is, it came upon the midnight clear. That's why I knew it by heart, and I enjoyed it, and I grew up hearing it every Christmas. It was music for us. Now, for us here in America, what's the number one favorite Christmas carol? Can you guess? Some of you were in my Sunday school class. It is Silent Night. How about the Britain, Great Britain? What is the number one favorite Christmas carol in Britain, in England? Joy to the World is number two. Deck the Halls, no? Oh, Holy Night is number one. What I really grew up with, it came upon the midnight clear. It was written by a Unitarian minister, Edmund Sears, and it used to be known as the Angel Song. And if you don't know why it's called the Angel Song, I want you to take the hymnal with you today and sing it at home, and you'll understand why it's called the Angel Song. It talks about the angels in our lives. Uh, it talks about the angels that appeared at Christ's birth, it talks about angels. It doesn't talk about Jesus. It doesn't talk about the birth of Jesus. It talks about the angels. So it has been called the angel song for many, many years. It was written by Edmund Sears, and he was a clergyman. You know, um, you've always seen me, so you always think that clergy, we preachers are extroverted, gregarious, you know, I've never met a stranger in my life, and I never stop talking. But not all clergy are like me. There are a lot of clergy, in fact, in the United Methodist Church, uh, the majority clergy is introvert. Can you believe that? I think that's a good thing, because they think before they talk. 
<laughs> now, Edmund Sears was an introverted guy. He was a thoughtful guy. He was somewhat shy and very reserved kind of guy. And back in those days, he was born in 1810. Back in those days, when you were married at age 15, 16, 17, 18, and when you were 20, you were kind of old, he married late in, uh, when he was 29. And he pastored a small country church, and he loved it, loved it, loved it, and they loved him. It was a great fit. And he was, you know, all he could see was a bunch of trees and so peaceful. And he wrote, he preached marvelous sermons, very thoughtful, reflective uh, sermons. And then he got married at age 29. And then you know what happens when you get married. Children after children. And he had lots of children. When you have lots of children, I always say, you know, when Lee was born, I was just giving away money a little bit here and there. And then Sophia was born, it was bucket full of money. <laughs> so after he had four children, he realized the salary that he was making at, little, at this little country church wouldn't do it. So he decided, as a family, that he would take on a bigger parish. So he went to Lancaster, a big city, and took on a big church. Now, a big church, <laughs> with big church comes more responsibility, more people, more complaints, and more phone, phone ringing. <laughs> so he was just totally stressed out. And after pastoring for seven years at a big church, he had a complete nervous breakdown. To the point where he could not talk. And as a family, they decided to move back to the country church where he started pastoring. And during his time of recovery and being loved on by people, God's people, he wrote this him. And he wrote in his diary, I have always believed in God, but God has sent me all these angels along the way, especially when I was on the low, the deepest, darkest time in my life. God has, me, has sent angels to me. Now, some of you may not believe in angels. I do, because I have personally experienced. Now, I have not seen those cute angels that show up on Hallmark cards with fat, rosy cheeks and wings and all the glitters and everything, but angels showed up every time I have a difficult time. I was telling our Sunday school class this morning that last Sunday was one of my deepest, darkest it was one of the very difficult times, and I was struggling to get up here to preach. And, you know, all kinds of things happened that week. We lost Edith, and, and, uh, and there were complaint calls, and this and that, and district office, and, and all these things happened. And then Steve comes up here and says the most encouraging word, I know that God has sent Steve and made him say what he said. When I just started my ministry as a green person, I was in my 20s. I was a youth and recreational minister at a big church. And part of my job was to minister to children and youth. And there was one particular child in that congregation he was always dropped off at 9 o'clock and picked up at 12 o'clock. Her parents were a lawyer and professor. And they didn't believe in God. And this child insisted going to Sunday school and to worship every week, rain or shine. She refused to go to vacation because she had to go to church on Sunday. I don't know where she got that from. And she was going to that church for a long time. Ever since she was little, she was baptized in that church. Parents never came. 
And when she was 11, she was diagnosed with leukemia. And she was in uh, Eggleston Hospital right there on campus. And every time her lab results came, we all sat there and cried. Because the number that needs to improve always going the other direction. And it was in the thousands. It was just unheard of. Her parents, of course, were at the bedside of, you know, and, and just, they never prayed, but they prayed for this child's recovery. The night before she died, she, I was right there. She sat up on her bed and she said to her mama, mother, don't you see these angels? Don't you see these angels? We just broke down, all of us, and cried. I believe in angels. How many of you have experienced angels in your life who encouraged you, who took you and led you to the presence of God? This hymn, this Christmas carol, it came upon the midnight clear, reminds us of all these angels that God sends to us along the way. Some of us are having a very difficult time this Christmas because of our physical ailment, because of our um, family members, because of our ailing body, because of relationship or finances or worries about the future, I want you to have these carols in your heart, these words on your lips. Sing them, not just sing them, live them. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you.